So more examples of the, the close parallels between the U.S. and Japan. There have been not radioactive, but steam accidents where workers have been killed. So at Mihama, Unit 3 in Fukui, again, four workers were killed after a steam explosion. The subsequent investigation revealed a significant lack of systematic inspections at Japanese nuclear power plants. Surrey in Virginia, which David Lockbaum mentioned yesterday, may have cleaned up its act a bit after two separate steam fatality accidents. Um, one killed two workers in 1972, another one killed four workers in 1986, and that's the single largest loss of life uh, at a at nuclear power plant in the United States. Surrey's also infamous because they're experimenting with dry cask storage out there. They have a real smorgasbord of different cask models, and they've had problems. They've had leaks of the inerting uh, heat transfer gas um, out of one seal, perhaps out of a second seal. It hasn't leaked completely out, but if it does, oxygen can get in, the waste can overheat, and you can have corrosion of deterioration of the fuel inside. So um, this slide is about radioactive steam releases. Now these are not scalding people to death, but they do contain radioactivity that then leaves the site. Daiichi had such an incident in 2006. A really uh, controversial one was the January 2012 steam release from a failed steam generator tube at San Onofre in Southern California. Uh, the two units at San Onofre are still shut down 14 months now due to uh, a faulty design and fabrication of steam generator replacements, which cost $617 million. And for details on that, Arnie Gunderson is the expert witness for Friends of the Earth on this matter, and uh, hopefully those reactors will never start up again. There's a groundswell of anti-nuclear uh, um, activism in Southern California to keep them shut down. So earthquake risks. Um, before Daiichi, there was the 2007 quake, ironically on the Trinity atomic blast anniversary at Kajiwazaki Kariwa, which is the largest nuclear power plant in the world, seven large-scale reactors, some of which had begun to come back to service, but then the 2011 earthquake catastrophe, of course, has shut down all operable reactors in Japan except for two in Fukui Prefecture at the Oe nuclear power plant. Earthquake risks at Indian Point Indian Point happens to be located immediately adjacent to earthquake faults that were not known about when it was constructed. And seismologists at Columbia University confirmed their existence in 2008, and the NRC has been forced to admit that this is probably the most vulnerable nuclear power plant in the country to earthquake risks because it wasn't built that well. Granted, Diablo Canyon and San Onofre are still vulnerable to earthquakes and tsunamis, but they were built more strongly because there was a recognition that San Andreas was right there. Indian Point, they had no such appreciation. And this image shows Indian Point in the distant background on the Hudson River, and uh, Mrs. Sas Sashiko Sato, a Fukushima organic farmer, Eileen Miyoko-Smith from Green Action, and also an organic farmer from Hokkaido, and another leader of the anti-nuclear movement in Hokkaido, we went up to visit the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition folks. That was September 2012. So um, this is just the cover of the New Yorker, another haunting image from, from March of uh, 2011 that was published on the date of the Three Mile Island anniversary, actually, March 28th. And uh, so I just wanted to go to some additional risks that weren't mentioned in that AP article from March of 2011 in Japan and their parallels in the U.S., Reactor pressure vessel embrittlement, the neutron bombardment of the eight inch or so metal walls of a reactor pressure vessel over years and decades, and the, the impurities in the metal creating cracks which can line up, and if the emergency core cooling systems are ever activated, the final line of defense to prevent a meltdown, the, the thermal shock of the temperature decrease combined with the high pressure can crack these vessels. And if that happens, it would be uh, an un... Uh, an irreparable loss of coolant accident. There's no contingency in place. So the worst in Japan, the worst in the United States, another Entergy atomic reactor, just like Indian Point. Risks that have been mentioned are the high-level radioactive waste storage pools that are not located in radiological containment structures. Bob Alvarez talked about that much better than I can. 
Um, we're having headlines about leaks at Hanford, and the irony of this is it harkens back 70 years, really, because Hanford generated the plutonium for the Nagasaki atomic bomb, continued to for the Cold War arsenal. Well, those high-level radioactive waste liquid and sludge storage tanks. The single-shelled ones, when they leak, it's directly into the environment. The first double shell had a leak in August. Granted, it's between the walls of the two shells and not out yet, but it shows there's problems. Leaks at high-level radioactive waste storage pools in the United States. There are more than a half dozen pools in the U.S. that have uh, documented leaks. Indian Point's pool leak is ongoing as we speak. Brookhaven's is uh, very significant because millions of people drink the water in the aquifer under Long Island. So false solutions, a big fight that's coming our way, centralized interim storage. They want to uh, put the waste onto the roads, the rails, the waterways, including the Hudson River, is possibly targeted for 58 barge shipments of high-level radioactive waste from Indian Point down to the port of Jersey City to get it to parking lot dumps, whether at a place like Savannah River site on the right here, um, or waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico, or Native American reservations out west. All for what? To create a shell game on the roads and rails and waterways, because if it goes to a parking lot dump for 50 years, it may have to go right back to where it came from for permanent disposal. It accomplishes nothing except transfer of liability onto the American taxpayer from the utilities that profited from the generation. I mentioned the good news at Kiwani of shutdown. The only two reactors in Japan currently operating are these, OE, but the other 48 operable reactors in the country are not operating, and it's a real testament to the Japanese people and anti-nuclear movement. A lot of this has already been talked about by previous speakers. The 1972 warnings that the Mark I was a catastrophically flawed reactor. Um, the, the GE3 blew the whistle in 1976. Uh, also in 1986, the, the NRC's point man at Three Mile Island warned about the Mark I. So we have a campaign at Beyond Nuclear called Freeze Our Fukushimas. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Fukushima catastrophe beginning, we prioritize the Mark I's and Mark II's. If we can't shut these down for safety risks, then you know what can we shut down after, after Fukushima? The Japanese parliament identified collusion between regulator and industry as the root cause of the Fukushima catastrophe. We have collusion in spades in the United States between the nuclear power industry, and here are four of the five NRC commissioners. They are poised to pass a majority vote against putting filters on the vents at the Mark I's and Mark II's, bowing to pressure from industry and from House Republicans. So uh, Gene Stilp, who's a watchdog on Three Mile Island, a survivor of the accident, lives in Harrisburg, showed up in Michigan in 1999 with a banner that said, Three Mile Island, this is a Bob Del Tredici photo, Chernobyl, and he said, where next? And of course, we have to add Fukushima to the list, and we again have to ask, where next? We have to shut them down before they melt down. Thank you.